It was in terrain like this that the great armies of Napoleon and Hitler were beaten by the savagery of northern winter. For the next three months, the Royal Marines will train here, simply learning how to stay alive. Okay, you're going to start plastic bags here, and 15. Just empty the contents of your pockets. You can keep any um, survival items that you normally carry in your pockets, any food, anything else that you've got in your pockets, stick in the bag and put your name on with the white tape. The initiation, okay. by their standards, okay. is relatively right. gentle. Later, temperatures will fall to minus 40. But for now, a mere 10 below is considered severe enough to turn them out bereft of tent, sleeping bag, or even top coat. Well, we're not completely taking everything off them. Um, it's a progression now. They've had um, a night in snow holes, which is a semi-survival situation, or you can dig a snow hole tactically. Um, we're throwing them now into a situation where they've lost their kit. Um, for one reason or another, perhaps um, it was being ported by a helicopter, BV, or whatever. Yeah. And they find themselves in a situation in the tree line um, where they don't have anything but their belt order and what they're rigged in. And normally, um, they would have to then make improvised shelters. We'll let them keep their survival kit, which they normally carry on them anyway. But all their luxuries, uh, such as um, duvets, sleeping bags, etc., etc., uh, will take off them. Makes you wonder if we're going to be A's at the end of this or ML's. Electing to spend their lives in those parts of the world which other tourists never reach, not to mention the ubiquitous absence of discos, bars, or flush lavatories, has not entirely dulled their critical faculties. You get told that you've got to have survival this, survival that, survival the other. Right, you're now doing a survival exercise. Take all your survival kit out your pockets, put it in a black plastic bag. I think it's, it's good for the, uh, basically for the experience. Yeah. Um, well, let's face it, the worst comes to the worst. You could lose your jacket, you could lose anything, and you're going to be stuck there on your tod with nothing. So it's, it's handy to be able to, you know, just to, to hack it, really. Because let's face it, if it came to that, the tactics would go out the window. You'd be there to survive and only to survive. And if you didn't find some form of shelter, you, know, you wouldn't have much alternative but to surrender. So just one of these things. When you're gonna, if you don't get into shelter out here, you're going to die. It's as simple as that. So it's handy to sort of just to muck in and be able to, to crack it with no kit. Yeah, it's all good character building stuff, I suppose. But it, it is a, a risky business, which is why we're the, we're the best troops in the world, of course. Hopefully, it will be a lasting plato. But in the event of conventional ground attack, these men will be the first to face the Russians. I think it's vitally important to always know your enemy, no matter where you are, and uh, no matter what the scale of the conflict. Um, I'm certain if I was going to have a punch up with anyone, the first thing I want to know about him is how big he is, how good he is, whether he's a black belt in karate, uh, what weapons he's carrying, and it's exactly the same here. So I've, I've made a point myself, and most of us have, of actually doing a lot of work to finding out uh, how good our enemy is going to be and where his weaknesses lie. And without any names of pack drill, we all know who our enemy is going to be uh, in the event of the balloon going up. The popular concept of a Russian soldier is, is either an Arctic Superman or, or a, a semi-literate Mongolian oaf. And in fact, the truth lies somewhere between the two. Um, some of them are very well equipped, indeed, very well equipped in certain areas. And in other areas, they seem to have neglected it uh, quite considerably. Um, for instance, their, their personal clothing will vary a lot according to what units they, they belong to. But um, what the Russian soldier is very pleased with at the moment is a quilted undersuit, um, quite similar, in fact, to the one that we use. Uh, they consider the best thing since sliced bread, which is very, very good. But th their overgarments can vary from a, a one-piece coverall, uh, which is reversible, camouflage reversible, uh, to, to a greatcoat, um, and obviously, uh, I wouldn't like to ski very far with a greatcoat on uh, for ventilation purposes. Furthermore, they don't, uh, as far as is known, the average Russian soldier doesn't get issued with a sleeping bag, even in, in these conditions, and must uh, do his best there. I wouldn't fancy it myself, to be quite honest.
Their grasp of Soviet resources, from weaponry to thermal underwear, implies that British intelligence isn't quite as bad as it's cracked down to be. The ZSU 23 4, which is an anti, an anti aircraft uh, weapon system, uh, is built with heated uh, handbars and foot pads for the operator. Um, again, it's a little, it shows how seriously they take the winter, winter side of things. It's a formidable enemy. I think so, yeah. Mm. Not unbeatable, but uh, I think it's a mistake to underestimate them, definitely. In this code that we'll be using next week. Since their primary function is to relay back information from the enemy's front garden, coding must be mastered. OK, next week you're going to embark on the beginning of your tactical exercises in Norway, your first exercise. On that exercise, you're required to communicate. In fact, one of your prime functions will be to communicate and to report. The information that you'll be reporting on will be of a classified nature for the first time. And to report that information back, obviously, we're not going to be able to send it in clear. We are going to have to send it in a code of some description. The code I'm going to talk about today is for sending information of a confidential nature. And it has a limited, a limited security on it, a limited time that it's secure for. I'll be going into how long it is secure for when I get into the lecture. Temporarily, this bland stretch of Norwegian snowscape is home from home for four Marines. Yet, without knowing where to look, you've more chance of running into Father Christmas than spotting them. For survival in time of war, concealment must mean invisibility. This is no academic introduction to the twilight zones of warfare. Most of them, operating in teams of four, did precisely this for real in the Falklands War. So how close is close to an enemy position? We were 35 metres from uh, an Argentinian position down south. We were just lying on a little ridge, uh, a rock ridge. We could hear them talking, cooking, singing and dancing, basically. Uh, and they were, we, were, we estimated them to be about 35 metres, give or take a metre or two. It was, uh, we moved in at night and it was all quiet, you know, and, come the morning, then they were all getting up and making breakfast and we couldn't believe we were there. It was almost sitting in amongst them. But we just sat still. It was only a two-day OP anyway. It could be a day, it could be a month, it could be two months, it could be a long time. Tango, Mike. Yep. Charlie, Bravo. Is that it, is it? That's it, yeah. OK, then. However accomplished their concealment, there remains one nerve-testing aspect of the job which leaves them constantly vulnerable to discovery. The moment they begin to transmit a signal, enemy radio direction finders can establish a fix on their position. With today's modern equipment, they can trace back. It's uh, a little like the old detector van, all right? Uh, for the television, they can do the same thing with us and uh, find out where you've been transmitting from. Of course, we, we have measures to minimize or to make this very difficult for them but it, it can happen and, and does happen and has happened um, as i say it's very nice to be out there on your own uh, if you remain undetected but uh, the more information you're, you're you're transmitting the more likely or the bigger the probability is that you will be detected and get some kind of direction finding device on you even when you can hear them it's still difficult to see them Their constant predilection for stripping off should not be misconstrued. The unromantic explanation is that they'll sweat while digging snow, and later a soaking vest would swiftly freeze into a straitjacket.
The architecture of their temporary homes is considerably more attractive than you'll see in many urban conurbations. They've tunneled 50 feet into a snow slope at a depth of eight feet below the surface. The biggest problem we've got with the, the soft snow on top is it, it does tend to shrink and every night it, it'll shrink a little bit more until eventually it collapses. Uh, we've got so much snow beneath us we could counteract the sinking by digging down every day and I'm sure the other lads will agree virtually indefinitely you can stay in something like this. Others live above ground in two-man tents but above or below the unrelenting enemy is the cold. Rules must be obeyed. Tactically possible, we want to get in our bags. We want to get the cold, wet kit off and start getting some of this snow off of the boots and get the boots stowed away in the bottom of the sleeping bag. The reason for stowing them in the bottom of the bag, if you leave them out and it freezes at night as the temperatures go down as it gets dark, the boots freeze up and you end up with a pair of refrigerators in the morning. You go sticking them on your feet and the next thing you know you're going down with frostbitten toes. Well, it, simply to burn one candle in here will keep the temperature at about zero to minus one, which is a comfortable temperature for out here, basically. You don't need any form of heat. Uh, that's it. The kit you've got keeps you warm. As long as you've got a candle going, you know that basically you've got enough oxygen. And sometimes it starts to dim, you realise that you're getting a bit short on the old air. <clears throat> so you poke a hole through the roof with a ski pole. Get the jacket in and stow it in the bag. Okay, that's nice stowed away. Next thing we want is the gloves. The gloves are always wet. They're always either near the snow or in the snow or you've been sweating. Get the inners out, fluff them up. Same with the other one. And we can stow these against the body. The easiest way I find is to stick the inner down the trousers like so. That way, next to the body, the own body heat starts to dry them out and they're nice and warm. It comes in, uh, the main meal comes in a, a plastic packet and in there you've got a sachet of beef granules <coughs> which are dehydrated which require water added to them. You've also got a packet of dried apple flakes which you can mix into a, a dessert. Uh, but to carry all those bits of paper around with you naturally adds to the weight when you're carrying quite enough kit as it is. So uh, what a lot of the lads tend to do, and in this case Digger's done, is mix it already. Now, and you can see in there, there's a lot less weight in that than there is in that. And in there he's, he's got his beef granules, his uh, quick dried peas, and his apple flakes. More scoff than a scoffier, but at least it's hot. Indeed, there are many reasons why the Whitehall mandarins don't venture this far too often. Right, next thing, we've got the old socks. Socks are always wet. Your feet are always sweating. Get the socks off. Boots back on, keep the feet warm. Just open them out. Best place to put these is near the armpits, somewhere where it's gonna be really warm. So tuck them in there. Okay, it's a bit uncomfortable because they're damp at first, but as they warm up, you don't notice them, especially when you get in your bag. It's a bit, uh, a bit of a cramp at first because you've got your boots in the bottom, your gaiters and your jacket here at the side. But once you're in your bag, you start warming up. So the next thing you're going to start thinking about is food. There are some people who can be very good soldiers in, in a normal environment, but out here they just don't click. So you've you've um, got to have a lot of willpower to keep yourself going in times. You get very cold, it's very easy to wrap your hand in and say, oh, what the hell with it? and sit down and that's the uh, recipe to work your way into a wooden coffin. It's, uh, you've, you've got to have willpower to keep yourself going even when things get really very uncomfortable. OK, we've got here another visual demonstration of what can happen if you don't maintain your kit properly and don't carry out the correct drills. As you saw earlier, the guy always put away his uh, mittens inside his sleeping bag. This glove's been left outside in the cold. He's now going to try and throw this smoke grenade with the freezing mitt on. As you can see, he can't. There's no way he can get rid of it. Oh, he has done. He has done there. But uh, in the first instance, the grenade went off. And as you can see, it's melted. Not if you can turn it so the light can show it. It's melted onto his onto his glove. Now, if that was a white phosphorus grenade, or even worse, a high explosive grenade, it'd have 
wiped out himself and uh, whoever was in close range of him. So again, another very serious lesson to be learnt there. To the birthplace of Nordic skiing, they introduce a handicap which would do much to enliven the Winter Olympic Games. Backpacks weighing almost a hundredweight. Home base has every modern comfort, but they rarely see it. Life is mostly lived in sub Jack London conditions in bivouacs. <laughs> That's it. In fact, it's a bit of a surprise, it works. <laughs> the hazards of merely living here are such that mostly there is medical assistance within shouting reach. Well, this sort of climate, you talk basically about your hypothermia, your frost nip, and your frostbite. They're the basic injuries, but then with, entailed with your skiing, you've got your fractures, and then with things like this, tentai, carbon monoxide poisoning, just goes on and on, constipation. They're all quite common industry, <laughs> common injuries. <laughs> constipation being the best one. From time to time, however, problems considerably more exotic than constipation occur. This happened in, a, in one of the commando units that um, they were having a piss up in the naffy. And uh, one of the blokes goes outside to have a swamp. And uh, there was a galvanised bin outside. <laughs> and I think it had been about... I think it was about minus 15 to minus 20 outside. So he does this quick swamp, and as he's shaking his jake, it slaps against the side of the galvanised bin. So the next thing, he's shouting for help, and uh, they had to get an ambulance down, and the next cool. thing you know, he's picking him up with the galvanised bin into the back of the ambulance and taking him into the sick bay to, uh, to warm him up to peel his jake off the bin. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one of the, the emphasis on survival is now such that I wonder what would happen if you suddenly transported these men to a five-star hotel suite in Monte Carlo. Probably <laughs> set fire to all the chairs. <laughs> Eat your feet, food with your fingers. No, but I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't turn it down. At once... To prevent the cerebral processes from freezing up, each man is required to prepare and deliver a lecture. Some reveal an articulacy and clarity of thought which could well lead to a lucrative career in television criticism. On the 11th of December, Major Vidkin Quisling was introduced to Rida. Quisling was the leader of the Norwegian Fascist Party and also held the post of War Minister. He assured Rida that no British intervention could be resisted by the Norwegian government. And after this meeting, Rida took Quisling to Hitler. But the Fuhrer, occupied with the planning of the Spring Offensive, showed little interest. He listened in virtual silence to Quisling's projects and after the interview told Reader to handle the affair with discretion. Good afternoon gentlemen, my name is Carl Craig. The normal principles of camouflage and concealment, shape, shine, shadow, surface, spacing and the rest are as well... Oh, let's start again. Do that on me because there it is. Good afternoon gents, my name is Carl Craig. The principles of movement and cam concealment in a snow-covered terrain apply as firmly as they do in any theatre of operation. It's still a matter of common sense and good soldiering. However, there are many problems peculiar to the Arctic conditions that considering... Good afternoon, gents. My name is Cortal Craig. The normal principles of camouflage and concealment, shape, shadow, surface, space and silhouette, and movement and aircraft... Others find this terrain more difficult. Our old friend Corporal Craig, hero, you may recall, of two classic night climbs in an earlier programme, stumbles around now in the very foothills of Syntax. ...and equipment is to be achieved. Therefore, this afternoon, it is mine and Corporal Morris's aim in the next 30 minutes to show you how difficult concealment can be and in the same context, show you how easy concealment can be. I want you to close your eyes and just try and listen in and try and recognise the following sounds. 
Craig had the splendidly creative idea of setting up a kind of panel game which requires his examiners, with their eyes shut, to identify a number of sounds. Quite what sounds never becomes apparent because there aren't any. OK, we'll try the next sound. OK, we'll try that one again. We want you to listen in carefully and try and listen in to the next sounds that are quite common to us when we're working in the field. As the deafening silence of a failed experiment continues, the corporal in front of Craig's name becomes increasingly jeopardised. No. OK, try then. Come on, Jan, get your act together. Listen in. OK. Can I have a quick word? Yes, a couple sir. of things. A lot of therefores in the beginning. All right. Therefore, 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 therefore. I think you could have weighed off your actual lecture plan a bit, got it a bit tighter together. I don't know how much you rehearsed it. You can't stand up in front of a class and start three or four times. All right, I know they're here, but that doesn't make any difference at all. Shouldn't do. If you're going to be an instructor, you should be able to get up and give it straight away. What are the principles of camouflage and concealment? Basic principles. Keep it outside. All right, what are the basics? Shape, shine, shadow, yeah. silhouette. Well, you said that in the start, sir. What did you just come out with? Uh, if you're going to reiterate... That was a sum up. Yeah, well, when you, when you sum up, if you're talking to a novice, if you're talking to a guy who's just out of training, and you come up with five, and he comes up with seven, mm. you're going to come up with a whole lot. You've always got to be the same. Shape, shine, shadow, silhouette, movement, noise, and light. OK, they're all there, aren't they? All part and parcel. But I think it could have been a bit more professional, all right? Just a bit more... You two working together a bit more would have made it more professional. And if you're going to have noises, and you want people to stand here with their eyes shut, Make sure the noises happen. I felt a real goon stand here with the cameras rolling, my eyes shut, Have hearing been nothing. Folks? Pardon? Been yeah. okay. Back in their Norwegian headquarters, relieved of the day to day action most of us would hate, they reveal a curious change of character. Suddenly, there's a sullenness and boredom you'd hardly expect of them a state of dormitory depression reminiscent of reluctant school boarders. Possibly, as in the case of Corporal Craig, it's nerves. Not about injury, but the fact that they can come this far and still fail the course. Every now and again I've been reminded by certain people who's in charge of the course that my position isn't that secure and I've got to keep trying hard, you know, and I keep digging out blind and I can really keep trying, you know. And sometimes I feel as though it's just not enough, you know, because you can't keep them certain people happy, you know, you know no matter what you do. Um, I'm, I'm exactly the same as Tomo. If I come to the end of the course of March in the office and he's failed me, apart from probably bouncing off four walls with rage, I'll get outside. I'll leave the corps, join the police force or something like that. Or, you know, some other secure job where there's a bit of a future in it. But if I pass the course, then I'll, I'll be quite happy to stay in and do the job best I can. There's another factor you rarely associate with fighting men. They have been separated from their families now for all of six months. Sometimes it really gets to me. I try and put it to the back of my mind. Like when I first got out here, I was so depressed about being away from home. I've got pictures of me wife and children up there and I didn't put them on the wall. I put them up at first and because every time I went by them, I was looking at them and I was getting depressed, so I, you know, I took them down. It might sound a bit soft to a lot of people, you know. But I took them down and put them away and I tried forgetting her, tried putting her out of the mind. And I was getting lots of letters from her, but I wasn't writing home. And the reason why I wasn't writing home was because it was depressing me to try and write home and try and think about it. And all I kept trying to do was put her at the back of my mind, concentrate on the job. And then I settled down and got into the swing of being out here and being away again. Bung my pictures up and things haven't been too bad. So beneath the flak jackets and occasional tattoo, they do beat human hearts. When you've got this amount of guys living on top of each other, privacy is a big thing. Uh, you need it as well. Uh, you do need to escape uh, each person in their own way. Uh, some people don't need privacy as much as others. Uh, then you get the individual who needs to be on his own quite a bit. Um, they usually find their own ways of doing it. Everybody has. Uh, some guys will 
they'll just go for a walk, go down, uh, even if they go down the laundrette, say, uh, they'll take the hi-fi down there with them and they'll just sit in there reading a book and listening to the hi-fi. If Sergeant McLean, taskmaster and mentor, occasionally feels the same, he can't join in the moaning. He takes it out on his racing bike, going absolutely nowhere. Just occasionally, though, even McLean's laconic style gives way to tetchiness. Right, your AWT written. If I wanted to, I could turn this into an almighty bollocking. Or not. I want it to go in, what I've got to say. All right. <clears throat> the highest mark um, was Lieutenant Hutton. It doesn't really bother him too much now. So, Matthews, 249. Corporal Thompson, 233. Corporal Mills, 228. Corporal Clayton. Hey, Vinny, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. The intellectual distractions are mostly limited to films, and the films are mostly limited to the subject closest to their hearts, the Marines. Since there aren't many films about the Royal Marines, they have to put up with the Americans. At least they have one advantage. Last night's fiction can become this morning's fact. Their own helicopter is to lift them out to the start line of a 200-mile forced march. This is what they've come for, and it will break or make them. I don't know more nervous than all me, I don't know. I hope it works. 